Travis, good morning. I believe we are live. So hello to everyone who's tuned in also. Thank you. Hello. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Big day. Congratulations. It was announced just a few hours ago that you are the latest company to go public in this crazy SPAC craze. Yeah, no, thank you. We're, uh, we're super excited about it and, and happy to be here. So tell me a little bit about the last year. I mean, <laughs> what a year it's been. At the start of the pandemic, no one wanted to use you know, public transportation or ride share, and that extended to scooters and bikes. But what I've heard from others in the industry is that activity has sort of come back in a big way over the last year or so. What have you seen at Bird? Yeah, so for those of you that don't know, Bird is a you know microelectric vehicle company with operations in over 200 cities now. Uh, we provide uh, electric scooter sharing services, and um, you know the the last year certainly you know we were impacted just like uh, a lot of businesses were. And uh, in, in when the lockdowns happened in March of 2020, we you know we pulled the vehicles off the road while uh, you know while we were waiting to see what what was going to happen, um, and. Ultimately, we put the vehicles back out in the summertime and we saw pockets of demand throughout cities across the globe. Um, but, you know, I think the, you know, the top line of the business was certainly impacted. But I, I think the silver lining for us, at least, was we really saw regulatory uh, acceleration of the adoption of, of, of microelectric vehicles throughout the last year. So cities really started embracing, uh, you know, Bird as a, as a way to get around cities. It's a naturally socially distanced way to get around. And most cities... You know, people weren't using public transit last year, and, and most cities were were trying to provide alternative forms of transportation. And uh, micro EVs and micro mobility is a great way to do that. So, were people more willing to come back to micro mobility, things like scooters and e bikes, than they were ride sharing and public transportation? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you see that in the data. I mean, we were certainly down year over year, but but I think you know, Bird is a naturally social distance way to get around your your city and. Um, it's just intuitively makes a lot of sense. You know, people last year didn't want to be in, in, in public transit or uh, even in some cases in a, in a, in a car with another, another person. And so, you know, in that regard, you know, we're happy Bird was able to do our small part in helping move people around cities. Are you back at the level you were at pre-pandemic or do you still have some ways to go? Uh, yeah, we're actually this springtime, we have seen, um, you know, massive demand, I, I would call it. So started with the U.S., market in, in March really started to pick up as the vaccines uh, started to roll out. And uh, we're actually up 2.6x uh, over this same time not in 2019, uh, 2020, mm -hmm. you know, a, we, we weren't operating this time last year. Uh, so we are seeing some pretty explosive demand starting with the U.S. market in, in March. Uh, and now even in Europe, we're starting to see a, uh, an acceleration as the European markets start to to reopen. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a great way for people to get outside of their house and rediscover their cities. So you've rebounded and then some, what did you make of Uber's decision earlier on in the pandemic to sort of offload its micro mobility options? Do you think that that was a bit too hasty now that we've seen this rebound? I recently spoke to the Lyft um, president, John Zimmer, who said that bikes have been, you know, one of their strongest, you know, strongest units over the last few months. Yeah, I can't I can't speak for uh, Uber or anybody else. But, you know, what we see is uh, a massive market opportunity. It's a, you know, micro mobility is an eight hundred billion dollar you know, market. And, and we think it's it's a massive opportunity, but not only just a big business. We think it's a great thing for the world to move people out of three thousand pound gas cars into short range uh, electric vehicles. We think uh, it's a big business opportunity, but one that happens to be also good for the world. So you've seen this rebound. There's, you know, this massive TAM that you've outlined, but you guys are going public at a valuation that's actually lower than your last private round. So I just wonder what led to that decision. Um, why are you guys not going higher at a higher valuation if you have seen this rebound? Well, like I said, our, our business was certainly impacted last year because of COVID. And, um, you know, I think when we when we went out through this process, you know, the numbers were starting to really bounce back in a very strong way. And like I said, they have they have bounced back now. Um, but, you know, when we when we looked at starting this process um, in with the switchback team back in, I guess it was January, uh, late January, early February. Now, um, we really just you know, when we were we were thinking about valuation. We didn't we didn't want to be greedy on valuation. We wanted to you know figure out what was the right 
uh, price that made sense to really optimize for getting long-term investors into the into the stock. Uh, and I'm really thinking about this as just a financing event and a milestone, but really we're thinking about the long-term, the years and decades to come and optimizing for long-term investors was most important to me. Right, so you found that Switchback was the right partner to go public, but talk a little bit about that. Switchback was actually created to bring an energy company public. How did they end up, how did they land land on you guys? Uh, well, you know, I, I think, um, after getting to know the Switchback team, I mean, we really felt like we had similar visions and missions as they did. I mean, we both believe in reducing carbon emissions by electrifying transportation. We both believe in the decoupling of, of the gas car. And when you look at Switchback One, which they did, they merged with ChargePoint. Uh, also, you know, similar vision and mission of electrified transportation. Um, and, and we saw the, the performance of the ChargePoint deal with Switchback. You know, we really liked that 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 case study and, and felt like uh, their their vision vision and mission was really aligned with ours. Right. So in a way, you're saying that you are kind of an energy play, a clean energy play. It's a clean energy play. Ex exactly. OK, cool. I, I want to talk a little bit about the SPAC process. We saw sort of a lull of activity when SPACs came under greater scrutiny from the SEC. We've seen them seen more of them recently. How did you decide to go public by SPAC versus traditional IPO versus direct listing? And, you know, instead of raising money in the private markets, which you've obviously been able to do. Yeah. So, you know, we felt like the, the, the timing was right for the company to go public. You know, we really focused on the unit economics over the last two years. And, and what I like to tell the company, eat our vegetables. And, and now we have positive ride profit of, of 40 percent. Uh, and positive ride profit of 15% if you exclude you know, vehicle depreciation. And so the unit economics are really working in the business now as we roll out the new vehicles. Um, Those are adjusted unit economics, right? That's not sort of straight. That's like adjusted EBITDA that takes into account depreciation on a bunch of other things, right? Yeah, I'm talking about uh, ride profit before, before OPEX, right? So if you just look at the unit economics... Uh, of the business on every single ride we do, how profitable are we? It's actually 40% positive now globally. Um, and then if you exclude vehicle depreciation, still about 15% positive globally on the unit economics. By the way, that's H2 of last year during a COVID year where you had uh, depressed utilization. Uh, so anyway, you know, the economics are working very well in the business now. And I think that's a testament to the new vehicles and the new hardware we continue to roll out and in, invest in. And, and we thought the time was right to take the company public and uh, I know the you know the SPAC, SPAC market has had its ups, ups and downs, and you know I like to think last year was really SPAC 2.0, and and it felt like things got a, a a little frothy where you had a bunch of you know some science projects uh, really <laughs> backing, but I think we've really entered SPAC 3.0 now, which is you're going to see uh, real companies with real business models and real revenue starting to to SPAC, and I think the pipe investors are demanding that, and so we're excited to be part of this new wave of SPAC 3.0. Great. Now, one area of the SPAC um, path to public markets is the idea of the warrants and the promote, which can dilute you know, new shareholders. And I've noticed, too, that um, Switchback and its disclosure committed to purchase 4.6 million warrants at $11.50. Um, do you think that, I mean, did you guys talk about this? Did you think about this? Because that's come under greater scrutiny as well. Um, are you certain that Churchill, if that excuse me, that Switchback is going to be a long-term investor here and not sell within a few months? Uh, well, look, the Switchback team has been great to work with. You know, we think they're strong partners. We think they are long-term investors. Like I said, you know, we, we think you know our missions and visions very, very much do align, and uh, we're excited to be adding Jim, the you know the the co-CEO of Switchback, to our board of directors. Um, along with some other strong people like Roloff Botha from from Sequoia and 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 Antonio from Valor and others. So, you know, we're very excited to to have Jim along for the long term with us. Are there any lockup requirements? Um, any way that you can sort of tell investors that are going to be buying shares now that yourself and other insiders are going to be staying in this company for the longer term? Yeah, so absolutely. There was uh, no liquidity as part of this transaction. We see it as a, a, a financing event and uh, a milestone. So nobody, no shareholders on the bird side uh, took liquidity. And there is a six month lockup period for all shareholders, uh, all employees and all investors. And so, uh, and, and, and obviously the sponsor is locked up for that period of time as well. And so we really are thinking about the long term here. 
Okay, great. And and you yourself too, you're not planning on selling any shares for a while or? No, no. Yeah, no, I'm a, uh, in fact, I, I, I invested uh, money last year. So. <laughs> okay, great, great. Good to know. So the other thing that's interesting about SPACs is you can make these forward projections that you can't do in a traditional IPO. Um, I was looking at the slides and you guys are going to go from a, let me just see, from a loss to um, a profit in a few years from now. And it was quite a big jump. And I just wonder, there's so much competition in this space. How can you be comfortable sort of laying out these targets? How do you actually get there? Right. So, you know, if, if you look at the, the gross margin line um, in the second half of last year, we we're actually positive uh, in, in gross margin. And, um, you know, we think the, the key is just continuing to uh, utilization to bounce back to pre-COVID levels. We're already starting to see that in the U.S. market and Europe's trending, you know, closely behind. Um, and then the other key is rolling out the, the new vehicles. We've really invested heavily in the in the in the BIRD 2 and BIRD 3 uh, vehicle platform. Uh, these vehicles are, are lasting now uh, 18 to 24 months on average. Um, and so you're really seeing sophisticated uh, vehicles that are, um, you know, really ruggedized, much bigger batteries. You know, one of the things that's exciting to me about this space is uh, every time we roll out new vehicles, um, a new cohort of vehicles, the economics of the business just keep getting better and better and better. And so, you know, back in my ride sharing days, when I used to focus on uh, onboarding drivers, uh, you know, one of the challenges was the economics would get tougher over time. Um, whereas with Bird, as we roll out new vehicles, the economics get better and better as the vehicles get more ruggedized and the batteries get bigger. That's it. So do you think that this industry is more profitable than the ride sharing industry? I, I think that if you look at the trend of both, I think as the, you know, as the vehicles, it's a key point as the vehicles and the hardware get, get more ruggedized, they last longer, they're harder to steal and the batteries get bigger and bigger every year. It's if you go back and look at the last three three years, the trend of our economics has been phenomenal, and it's really driven by, you know, that world class vehicle and and technology on the on the hardware side, and and so I think you will continue to see us uh, on a much faster path towards profitability. Well, Travis, we look forward to following your progress as a public company. Good luck, and thank you for chatting with us today. It's a great format to do this, and we got in more questions, I think, than we would have on live TV. Yep. Hey, I really appreciate you having me. Thanks. Yeah, come on again soon. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, take care.